All right, first I want to thank you guys for uh, coming out to our community meeting. Uh, we, one of the things that um, is very important to myself, and I think some of uh, our city as well, is to make sure that we're transparent and we're engaging our community on all the issues that happen in the city of Fort Worth. And so this is one of the offices that was created here shortly last couple of years. And we have had a new changeover in leadership in this role. And so I thought it was very important that uh, we bring Boncia out to the community. And some of the conversations I have had with her is that she wants to be accessible, touchable, reachable uh, in our community. And so first, I want to just kind of, I am Councilman Chris Nettles, for those of you that may not know or haven't seen me on the news or almost getting arrested uh, at the courthouse. Uh, I'm the councilman for District 8 here in the city of Fort Worth. And I think we have one of our ACMs that's here, Valerie Washington. We have our police department that is here as well. What other department is here with the police department? Uh, the NPO is here. Anybody else? Community engagement. Okay. Community Safety Partnership is here, also our commander. Um, and so we have a lot of people who are in the building today. And meetings like this allow us to get a more understanding of what's happening. Sometimes we say behind the scenes, but really it's just information that we, should, that we can share. And so we want to do that today, so we introduce our departments. Um, and I want to kind of give a history, a, a brief history, and anybody can correct me or add to it, the brief history of how uh, this office was initially created. So those of you that remember back in 2016, in December, uh, one of our dear sisters, um, who is no longer with us, uh, God, we're praying for her soul and her family, Jackie Craig, had an altercation, uh, uh, engagement with a police officer, and the community came unraveled. Uh, during that, in August 1st of 2017, six months later, the city council adopted a resolution appointing a task force of race and culture to kind of deal with some of the unrest that the city of Fort Worth was having. November the 12th, 2018, a final recommendation was approved about the recommendations that this task force came together and um, the things that we could do, and it just wasn't crime. It was health related, it was health disparities, it was housing, it was child care, and a, a number of things came under that recommendation. But tonight, we're gonna kind of focus on the criminal or officer engagement. And so, February of 2020, the OPOM office was first established, and it was established, um, I just lost it. Kim Neal. Kim Neal, thank you. <laughs> Kim Neal uh, came in and helped establish the office. Do you have something you want to jump in and say? Okay. Uh, and so tonight we really want to have a discussion with Boncia. Um, also, I want to take the opportunity before we get too far in is to thank Texas Westland. Texas Westland has been a great partner as it relates to District 8 and the surrounding communities. I see uh, board member staff here as well. And so uh, thank you, Texas Westland, for allowing us to use this space to have this community um, discussion. And so we're going to kind of open up the discussion. Boncia also has a PowerPoint that she's kind of kind of go through. But we want to get through things as quick as possible as well as take questions from the community. We don't want you to come in here and just listen to us. It's not no soap opera show. Uh, but we want to answer your questions. So first, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. And so for the community, can you, who is Boncia? What are you looking to bring to Fort Worth? And what have you already brought? You started a little bit ago. So for who is Boncia, I'm going to give this spiel because um, people are still figuring out who I am. Um, I come from Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana is where I started my professional career as an attorney. I was a prosecutor for several years, handling everything from low level misdemeanors to uh, multiple homicides, rapes, you name it. Um, I tell this story and if you've heard it before, I apologize, but I tell it because it's true and I think it helps center why I believe in police oversight and why I'm involved in this world. The very first case I tried um, as a prosecutor was almost overturned. 
It wasn't almost overturned because I was a young prosecutor and I didn't know what I was doing. It was almost overturned because two of the officers that were involved in the prosecution of that case were then involved in illegal behavior. It was unrelated to my case. I, I tried a distribution of heroin case. There was a flip witness, all the antics. It's, it's a great thing. We convict them. It's unanimous jury. And then the first assistant calls me in and says, hey, Bonso, you have to go meet with appeals because insert officer names here had just been served with an indictment. For me, one, it's just like, I, I, I don't understand. What did they do? They were accused and then ultimately found guilty of stealing money from confidential informants. I was confused because my case didn't involve a confidential informant. But as a lot of people will tell you, your integrity matters everywhere. So because those officers couldn't be transited, there are a case where there's a confidential informant, that threatened the conviction for the drug dealer in the neighborhood that impacted other people. And so that was my first introduction to police misconduct matters for everyone. This is going to hurt a community. And I'll, I'll go further to say that I had the opportunity to also prosecute officers for sexual misconduct for, and I'm just blunt, for raping young boys and raping young girls and watching what that did to the community. That's how I first got introduced into the world and realizing how you can lose convictions, how you can lose safety in communities when you have bad officers, but how when you have good officers doing the work, so the people who were doing the investigations on the sexual misconduct, then I could ensure that those officers were looking at convictions on 50 years for molesting young boys. So that was my first introduction. Eventually I went into police oversight and I started doing community engagement. I was a little burnt out. You can only try so many rapes and murders before you don't wanna do that work anymore. Um, and so I went into community engagement and I had the opportunity to swiftly transition into handling use of force because I'd handled so many murders. So that meant that I was out on the crime scenes looking at the bodies when there was an officer involved shooting, following every use of force that happened throughout New Orleans. I was promoted to the deputy chief there and then eventually I made my way here. I went through the strenuous uh, interview process for Fort Worth and um, I was selected as deputy and started here September of 2023 and it has been absolutely fantastic. One of the reasons I wanted to come Fort Worth, because oversight's popular now. We all know after 2020, there's oversight op offices popping up everywhere, is that it appeared to me that Fort Worth was committed to doing oversight. They were committed to improving the police department and they wanted to hear from the community and the department wanted to make sure that they were doing things properly. I didn't want to go somewhere where we can look at some of our other states where I was going to be here for six months and it was going to have to disappear. So I wanted to be somewhere where, yes, there's going to be a fight and it might be difficult, but I know that we can move the needle in the right direction. Uh, thank you for that. And I, and I will tell you that there is certain council members that we'll fight to keep, to make sure we have the old pump office. And you kind of mentioned there are other cities who, and states who are trying to dismantle this office. Uh, when it comes to equity, when it comes to equality uh, around the world, uh, these offices are being underfunded or defunded or whatever word you want to say are not funded uh, for the, the lack of transparency. And so I am grateful that the City of Fort Worth has taken a bold stand to create this office and make sure it runs um, as, as smooth as possible. And so uh, what is the OPUM office doing as it relates today? Uh, what is the everyday operations of the office? And you can give that and then we can jump into your PowerPoint and I can ask some more questions. So this okay. is who, it, thank you Taylor. This is who our office is and um, how we're set up. We are currently set up independent, and that means that we're not under city council. A lot of departments report directly to city council. We do not report to city council in our structure, and I don't have an ACM. We are supported by the city manager's office, but I report directly to the city manager. The separation is also important to note that while we work with the Fort Worth Police Department, we're not together. So our mail oftentimes gets sit to Bob Bolin, but we are a separate entity. We just have a working relationship. This highlights, we've already gone over the background, but what we do, the number one thing we do is receive and refer complaints. We're unique in this situation that you can come, being a community member can come to OPOM and file a complaint. You can go on our website, you can place a phone call, you can go through our social media and let us know of any misconduct or positive policing that you've encountered, and we take that. We take that information, we digest it, and then when we refer that to internal affairs, I want to highlight we refer it to internal affairs because while we can do a lot of things, we cannot investigate. We are a monitoring body, we're a reviewing body, we are not an investigatory body. So so we refer a lot of our cases to internal affairs. We also then review those investigations. 
every single internal affairs case gets reviewed by our office. So let's say hypothetically that the Fort Worth Police Department gets somewhere between, and correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, 538 misconduct complaints. 538 in 2023, a small portion of those, around 40 of them come to OPOM, but 538 of them are reviewed by OPOM. So it doesn't matter how it went in, we're gonna set our eyes on it to ensure the integrity of that investigation. And I'll talk about what we're looking for in a little bit. We're also going to monitor all use of force incidents. So we're gonna do a review on all of them and then we're gonna give more attention, of course, to our critical police incidents. That includes going to the use of force review board, the critical police incident review board and things of that nature. We're collecting data, we're making policy recommendations, we're attending community engagement events and we're trying to be more transparent and putting out the information and what's occurring within the police department. Some of you know through some of the struggles that have happened that there's a lot of things that are restricted from being made public through legislation. We are looking at creative and innovative ways to make sure the public is informed on what is happening with the police department so that you can feel comfortable with the department that you have. You wanna do the presentation? Go ahead. Sure, all right, I'm gonna stand up because the sitting thing is yeah, a little bit works. awkward. Okay, so I've already gone through who we are and then let's go to the next slide, Taylor. So our misconduct work, I tend to do a little bit of uh, talking back and forth, that's just who I am, but our misconduct work, that looks like any misconduct that happens within the police department. Now what I like to say is sometimes people don't know what that actually looks like. Like, I don't know if that amounts to misconduct. Guess what? Let me figure that out. I don't care. Do your gut check. If it made you uncomfortable, then that's fine. Send it my way because nothing bad is going to happen. So I don't want anyone getting nervous that, well, if I said it, if I said that the officer was rude and it actually isn't rudeness, then what's going to happen? That means that it's not going to be a complaint. That just means that we looked into it and we made sure that the officer acted in the ways that the general orders requires for them to act. Misconduct complaints, I'm gonna explain the complaint process. The misconduct complaint process is we receive your complaint or your commendation and then we send a receipt back to you. We're trying to increase the amount of communication that happens between our office and the community. Does any, did anyone possibly know what happened prior to OPOM arriving? Anyone know what happened with internal affairs? Because that's kind of what happened. So you could file a complaint and there wasn't a number you couldn't call and say, hey, what's going on with my complaint? Anything of that nature. But now if you file with OPOM, we say, hey, thank you, Ms. Johnson. We'll contact, we let you know what your complaint number is and we send it back out to you. Then you can also call us for updates said, what's going on with my complaint? I need to actually update on what's happening. Then we monitor that investigation. We're gonna monitor that investigation after it's been sent to IA to see what's happening. The goal right now, this, this is the goal where we're headed, is to monitor in real time. We wanna monitor in real time because I want a working relationship with the police department. It's not beneficial for me to wait till the end of the investigation to say, hey, I think you missed something because then we don't have accountability in that way. Then we're not actually improving investigations in that way. I want to monitor as we go along. Then at the end of it, at the end of the investigation, they're gonna send that completed investigation to us. Now, the timeline I wanna highlight is 180 days. That's by state's, uh, state law. Their internal policy is 120 days, but there is 120 days from the date of incident. I wanna highlight for that for the public because that means if something happened to you on Saturday, reach out to us on Saturday. Don't wait and think about it for a month and go ask your church family and your daughter and your sister and your cousin and go to the barber shop and say, what do you think about it? Well, I heard the officer was really nice. Maybe I shouldn't file a complaint because now we've lost 30 days to do an investigation. Now we've lost 30 days to see if there's additional evidence. Time is ticking. It doesn't matter when you disclose it. Unlike a lot of other things, the date it happens, there are six months, six months to conduct an investigation. There are a few exceptions for a criminal investigation to be conducted so we can get an extension from the attorney general for what, but for the general population, we're talking about six months. So as soon as we're involved in that, you can go to the Fort Worth app and you can go and file a complaint with us. After that investigation is conducted, we get the final investigation. So along the way, we wanna give feedback. Along the way, we wanna to say to internal affairs, hey, I was watching the body cam and I noticed this. Are you looking at this allegation? Before you send it to the chain of command, this was just a little bit concerning to us. Or I don't, it seems like you've raised a lot of allegations on that officer. Because people think that like we're just out to be a gotcha. No, we are quite neutral and we wanna make sure that what they're doing is in accordance with the general orders. So if I see something that looks retaliatory, where an officer has been rude, but on this officer, we've raised six different allegations. And I wanna raise that to internal affairs and go, this seems a little odd to me. 
Why are we raising so many allegations? The same way when I want to say, hey, why didn't we raise an allegation for rudeness in this one? So then we get the final investigation, and I'll talk in a little bit more detail about this investigation review process. We get the final investigation, and my team, who I want to highlight, OPOM team, can you stand, wave your hand? Because we're a small team. We're a small but mighty team. So I think the last number I got from Chief Notes was over 1,800 police officers. There's six of us now that are reviewing everything that's happening within the police department. Um, they review those investigations and provide all of our feedback and recommendations to internal affairs. Those recommendations are added to the final report. So when it goes out the chain of command, our recommendations are listed on there for consideration. Hold on, one back. So this is what it looks like internally. What does it actually mean to review or to monitor investigation? Because we say these words all the time. We receive it. I assign it to a poly policy analyst. We currently have three people who review and we're currently hiring for additional personnel. They review the initial complaint. What did the complainant actually say that happened? And did the actual investigation address those allegations? And then they start reviewing all relevant footage. That's body-worn camera footage, that's surveillance footage, anything of that nature. And then we're gonna review the interviews. Officers are often interviewed. If it's a personnel complaint and we don't have to go through all those details, officers are interviewed. Review that for consistency and see, did the officer say something that was of concern? I'll give you one example. Sometimes officers say something that's not actually a policy violation, but it's just concerning as an employee that maybe somebody should check on them because I'm a little bit concerned about their mental health. They have the wellness unit now and all these things, but maybe a supervisor just needs to tap in and make sure that they're okay because what they said during that interview is a little bit bothersome. It's not a violation. I just wanna make sure everybody's healthy here. Once we do that, then we identify any additional policy violations. One of the number one ones we see is body-worn camera. If you didn't turn your camera on or if it was muted, we're gonna highlight that because it's important. It helps protect the officers, it helps protect the citizens. And then we'll draft a report. They draft a report, they send it back to me. We go back and forth until we agree upon it. And then it's discussed with IA. Before we send over anything finally, we discuss it with IA to let them know our findings and then we provide it in writing. These are our numbers. The, starting in 2023, these are the formal allegations that were received by OPOM. The number one allegation that we receive is failure to investigate thoroughly. That comes most often from a uh, traffic accident, but any investigation, that's what's coming through the door most often is the officer didn't thoroughly investigate my case. They didn't collect surveillance, uh, they didn't, excuse me, they didn't conduct collect surveillance or they didn't interview, went to witness something of that nature. Then that's followed by conduct. For OPOM recommendations, this is what I said at the end of the report we attach. In our complaints, we've provided over 93 recommendations for complaints, 77 use of force recommendations, 20 for policy, and 11 other. For 2023, and I just kind of want to highlight these, I know we'll talk on it later, but in 2023, we had a total of eight accommodations. Year to date, as of today right now, we've already had four accommodations sent over for Fort Worth Police Department because people are utilizing the office more. And then I want to comp uh, compare, I've already said it, last year we had 40 complaints that came through OPOM. But year to date, 2023, March 26, there were eight complaints that came through. So far this year, we're at 15 for OPOM. So we're tracking to do almost double what we did in the previous year. And then this number, this is what I'm most proud of. I started in September, and I want you to look of where we are. This is the days to review an investigation. This is what we're charged with doing. We're charged with looking at every investigation that comes through internal affairs. But I told you there's a 180 day deadline. Now I can't tell internal affairs when they get it to me. We, we, we hope they give it to us in time. But that top number was in excess of 150 days. So that, that's right before I start. We are now down to a lot of our cases being sent out in five to four days after review of investigation. That means that we're going to have real tangible results or at least a chance at it. Looking at the last seven months, our average days of review to investigation is 29 days, and we're getting closer and closer to getting under the two-week mark. Our next charge is community outreach, doing things like this. In the spring and in the summer, you're going to hear a lot more from us, doing community conversations, making sure that we're having public conversations about the work that we do, dispelling the myths about the organization. We'll be having uh, coffees with the OPOM, which is simply small, intimate conversations where you can discuss with me your community concerns. And then we're also going to do them police facing because I know there's a lot of myths um, about who we are, what I'm here to do, and making sure that the police department is educated on the operations of our office as well. 
And next is our community police mediation program. Joined with me right here is Ms. Taylor Davis. She runs the community police mediation program. And my mediators, can you please wave your hand? These are people who volunteered. They are here on their own time, but they have sacrificed a lot of time. I'm going to explain what our community police mediation program is. Community police mediation is an opportunity to have an open, candid conversation. So normally what happens is you come in and you file a police complaint through internal affairs or through our office, and then it goes to investigation if it rises to that level. What we have changed is if, if it rises to the level of investigation, but we're talking about a low level misconduct allegation like rudeness or professionalism, then we say, hi fellow officer, we have a mediation program where you have the opportunity to discuss this incident with a community member for about two hours with two trained community police mediators. Is that something you're interested in? They can say yes or no. If they say yes, we would chat to the community member and say the same thing. If they say yes from there, then we're going to send it off to mediation. And what that mediation looks like, it's not a legal process. This isn't a situation where we go, who's right, who's wrong. It's identifying topics, values, and feelings to make sure that we get some type of understanding of what occurred. I, I have told this story, but I'll tell it again. I had a mediation before where uh, the most frustrated community member who cursed me like a dog when he came in for mediation, who I had to remind was, it was absolutely voluntary, sir. If you do not want to participate, you don't have to. And an officer who came in and said, this is dumb. I don't want to do this. I've talked to this guy until I was blue in the face. I don't know why we're here. Again, sir, you don't have to do this. It can go to investigation. They came to a meeting of the minds in there because we were separated from the incident, time had passed, the officer could finally hear what the person was asking, pulls out post-its and starts going, oh, this is what you need? Contact this person. Con it's not my job, but I'm a contact. This is who you need to reach out to. Sir, this is why I was a little frustrated that day. It doesn't make it right, but this, you weren't listening to me. This was going on. And the community member was able to say, do you know what I was feeling? I've been living in the city for how long? This is what's happened to me. And then you're disrespecting me. And that's how I felt. They literally cried when they walked out of that room cried. Now, I don't expect that out of every mediation. That, that's not my goal is to have a bunch of people weeping and doing kumbaya. That's not it. But if we can just change the perspective of a few officers, if we can change the perspective of a few community members, which the data supports will happen, then we're moving forward to a better Fort Worth. Over 90% of the time, officers say that if they had that same interaction again, they would change their behavior. Over 65% of the time, civilians say if they had that same interaction again, they would change their behavior. That is significant. I'm talking about 538 misconduct complaints that came through Fort Worth Police Department. If we could just change a few of those, imagine restoring trust in this community. So our mediators went through a 45 hour training program. They were not paid, they volunteered their time. They were selected because they could hold space, because they can be neutral, because they are brave and they want to give back to their community. They have gone, they, we met today during work hours where a lot of, they have to take off work in order to do these things. And so they're prepared to go through these mediations and to hold space. It is launching April 1st. I heard from the chief today, he is completely on board and we're going forward. So April 1st will be the first time that we send a case through mediation. Yeah, I want to ask a couple of questions about that and we can, um, I think it's important uh, in time as well. The mediators that we have <clears throat> that were selected, they went through an application process. Yes. Kind of give us, a, uh, were they selected from council members or they just applied online? How did that work? So they applied online. So we did a call through media, social media, through council members and uh, sending it out every which way we can to get mediators to apply. We had a total of 27 mediators apply and then they were interviewed by myself and Taylor. We were looking for neutrality number one. That is the number th one thing that we're looking for. You could have the background that you have, but do you understand the importance of being neutral? Understand, we weren't looking for a certain education level. We, we, we wanted to make sure we had variety in that because being able to communicate, that doesn't require a college degree. Being able to hear, that doesn't require a college degree. And then it was very important to us that it reflected the community as a whole. And that's the numbers that are up here. So they applied online, we interviewed, and then it was a scoring system. So Everybody was ranked, but we also looked at our demographics. We looked at our demographics because social science has proven that when you're able to match up demographics of the mediators with the people in the room, a lot of times it's more successful. 
I know that's uncomfortable to talk about, but that's just the truth of the matter. So we looked at it, and I had a lot of black women who wanted to be mediators. And I had to cut some of them, because my number one complainant, that's what these numbers are, was a white male. So we had to increase the number and manipulate from there. You had to be qualified to be a mediator. But when I had to look at demographics of what area of town do you live in, what is your background, socioeconomics, all of that plays a part into how comfortable we are in this space. And so our goal when selecting mediators for mediation is to match it up as much as possible. If we can't, they're trained, they're ready to go to hold space for anyone, but we know it's most successful when we create it in that way. In addition to the mediators, we also had police ambassadors. So we sent it out to the police department. They are allowed to apply to be ambassadors. Police officers cannot be mediators. They are ambassadors for the program. What they help do is one, they come out and support right now, but they also help spread the word to the fellow officers. Because I need buy-in from the officers to participate, but they also had to be able to show that they could be neutral and understood the importance of the program. Um, let's kind of talk about um, if they select to go to mediation, yes, that actually eliminates the investigation yes. process. Yes. So they can normally file a complaint and then there will be an investigation process if mm -hmm. the officer was ruled, if he was found, whatever it is, and maybe, maybe not discipline or whatever. If they choose this mediation process, that actually eliminates that investigation and discipline. Yes. So if you choose to go to mediation, there is no longer the option for an investigation. And by choosing to do a mediation, I mean, we've made it to you're going to be a good faith effort. So if you say, I'm going to go to mediation, and two weeks before the mediation schedule, you change your mind, then it's going to go back to a traditional investigation. But if we've selected to go to a mediation, the officer's prepared and the community members prepared, and they're making a good faith effort in that room, then it's considered mediated and no, long, no longer be investigated. But that's because what has been shown Number one, I want you to just, let's play hypothetical with me. How often do you think you have a sustained investigation for rudeness? Do you think it happens 50% of the time? Anyone? So what is our loss there? Because the number one complaint we're talking about going into an investigation right. is rudeness. Chances are, it's not going to be sustained. That, that, that's the chance, that's the reality. So what we do know is most people actually want to be heard. Most people want to actually use their voice and explain, this is how I felt in this situation. It's cute that your commander is going to come by and tell you and give you a coaching session and tell you you shouldn't do this again and then y'all going to kiki about this is what people are saying. I'm not saying that's what happens within the department. But what I'd rather tell you is how I felt. And for the officer, sometimes we need an opportunity not to think that you know, you're being punished and look at that as a real life situation. Because you remember what happened before the call, you're frustrated, I heard it on your body worn camera that you're mad about it and the person was being utterly ridiculous, but then you gotta look face to face with Ms. Johnson. I wasn't gonna listen to my commander telling me not to be rude because heck, he's rude. But now what I gotta deal with this civilian, maybe I'm actually going to change my behavior. And so I know for some people it's a pause of, well, why are they not being investigated? We're not losing anything by not going to investigation. Research has shown time and time again, having these guided and protected conversations produces way better results. It's the same way that they talk about like diversion programs and probation and things of that nature. That's why we've headed in that direction. And this mediation will allow us to uh, get, gravitate data. Yes. S starting April the 1st, we'll be able to know how many people went through mediation if change took place. And normally, I don't know what the percentage is uh, of an individual seeing an officer uh, again mm -hmm. on another traffic stop. Because if I'm traveling the same way every day to work or in a neighborhood the same day, mediation might be really important. Yes. Because I may see this officer in two weeks or three weeks or a month. And that interaction. Especially with your NPO, like we see them against NPOs repeatedly, being able to repair that relationship is significant. That, that is extremely important. I do want to stress again, while I'm saying that there's not an investigation, we're talking about low level complaints. Correct. So we're not talking about uses of force. We're not talking about discrimination. We're not talking about harassment. We're talking about rudeness, professionalism, uh, discourtesy, low level complaints, <coughs> not things that are going to end up in significant discipline or litigation, things of that nature. Awesome. And, and so moving a little bit from that, I want to ask a question about you're, the every day of OPUM office that you guys are looking at policies 
and practices of the police department. I want to hear a little bit about that. And then I, you mentioned that as of today, you have already sent some recommendations to the police chief. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell us how does that work? He has the option to, well, he's going to look at the police uh, the, uh, recommendation, but he has opp opportunity to implement it or not implement it. Right. But it is noted that we have sent this recommendation, it's on file, and say, for instance, five years some come down, that could have been prevented had this policy been implemented. Correct. So, so it's kinda... policy recommendations happen on a micro level and a major level. And so if we make an observation during a review of an individual incident that we see there's a gap in policy and practice, we can make that recommendation. Um, if it's dealing with, it needs to be clear in the general orders for when an officer is allowed to go on mute for their body worn camera because it seems like there's some misunderstanding, then we can make that policy recommendation. Or it might be a recommendation of there needs to be a roll call or a reminder for training because we're seeing this behavior over and over again. Um, I didn't mention earlier that we also participate in oral boards for officers. Excuse me, I'm going to highlight that um, with some confidentiality. We participate in oral boards, and that's the hiring process for officers. So I'm in the room. I don't have a vote. And that is the case for most things. So review board uh, for critical police incidents, use of force review board. I don't have a vote, but I have a voice in the room. And I'm kind of there to be like, hey, this is a concern. So um, without going into details, we saw a candidate. Um, when I first started, that was a little bit concerning. And so what that looked like was me reaching out directly to the chief to go, hey, I know we're going through this interview process, but I need to highlight this is not only a problem for OPOM, this is going to be a problem for the community. And that was taken, that's put in writing. So if anything ever came back, it won't come back because that person was not hired, not just because of what I said, but because they went and they did their due diligence to look at everything, that it's been documented on behalf that we, we raised a flag. Um, and that's for every policy. We're issuing recommendations for different use of force policies, tactics, trainings, things of that nature, but we're also involved in the conversations in real time. Last week, I participated in the Critical Police Incident Review Board. That's separate from like the disciplinary process. That's, these are what these incidents are. We're past discipline and everything else. Is there something um, as a professional that we believe the department could be doing better in order not to end up in this situation? Or is there something we can pull from this that we actually need to make sure it's implemented through the department to make sure that if it does happen again, it happens in this way? Okay, and we'll take about five more minutes and then we want to take some questions from the uh, audience uh, and at least stop at seven o'clock. And if you have sidebar conversation or questions, we'll be here at least about 20 minutes after seven o'clock. Uh, so I want to uh, kind of go a little bit down. You really covered a lot of things that we had already had yeah, listed. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's good information. And if there's something else that I ask or they ask and if you have a PowerPoint, we can I'll go back to that. Um, one of the issues that we have had come up in the city of Fort Worth is the uh, police chase policy. And that's a policy making. And, you know, we know the city council voted to do the, um, the lawsuit or whatever. Um, we had the police chase incident that happened on Evans and Rosedale. What if, what can you say, if anything, if you can't say anything, we understand. Uh, they released some of the information on the police policy. I have some recommendation, but what can you say uh, specifically about that issue? So unfortunately, and I, I should have given my disclaimer. I meant to, it's on my oh, top no. of list. I it was on my list as well. I can't <laughs> speak about open investigations. And so while we are committed to being transparent at the conclusion of the investigation, I'm happy to hold another town hall and we plan on it for our critical police incidents to make sure that the community is aware of what that investigation looked like. But as long as it's open and pending for the integrity of the investigation, I can't comment, it on, can't comment on it. And so yes, the pursuit policy was released. It was released um, with holding from some tactical information um, that the department believes should not be provided to the public. And at uh, some point, I did have the opportunity to review what was released and made a recommendation. That was an instance where I made a recommendation for, please include this in the part of the policy that's released. The department agreed with me and increased the amount that was released. And so that's kind of where that stands. And I hope to have a further discussion about it in the future. No, thank you for the information. I, and I know you mentioned it a, few, uh, a couple of sides ago about the 180 days and the ability because uh, community members came to me and said, well, it's been 120 days. Uh, and then we know specifically for this incident, there has to be some type of extension because right. it was broader than 
So what happened um, and how the extension happened is generally with a critical police incident, it is first investigated by major case, not internal affairs. It's a criminal investigation that's taking place first. I imagine like a lot of people, we want that done well. Um, and so then until that is done, and there's some variance, give me some grace in that, let's not do absolutes, then the administrative investigation doesn't start. They're now starting sooner, but until everything is completed, they will ask for an extension. We don't want to rush the administrative investigation to be 180 days if the criminal investigation's not done, because then you don't have a thorough investigation to hold an officer accountable if they need to be held accountable. So that's how that process works. So you're allowed to get extensions, which I recommend getting an extension to ensure that you have a thorough investigation. Uh, lastly, and I'll just mention um, um, in the recommendation of the Race and Task Force, uh, one of the recommend the conversation was sent around. Now, do we have anybody else here that was on that task force? I don't know if we do. And also, I want to thank other councilwomen for being here, Jeanette Martinez, who's also here present. Um, was the sense of an oversight uh, police board. And we know that city council at that time elected to do the OPOM office mm -hmm. instead of, maybe not instead, but just elected to do that. Uh, we, city council, took the, to the vote in November 2022 uh, with the support of Kim Neal and others. Uh, we know that in the city of Fort Worth, we talked about it earlier, about trying to, for one, make sure we keep funding the OPOM office and transparency. Um, at some point, I know that we could get to a yes, and that's with other council members who voted against it. But real briefly, what is your understanding of what an oversight board looks like? Because some people think it's investigating. Some think it's uh, with subpoena power, you know, firing an officer. What, what does that look like? Uh, in your views, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So the reality is it looks like all of those. The, the oversight boards vary as much as the names of the cities and as much as my type of office um, varies. We're completely different from Dallas. We're different from Houston. We're different from Austin. And so an oversight board or community-facing board or community-led board, I guess I will say, could do all of those things. The only thing that I would stress in before I had even applied, I, I watched all the videos and I heard the discussion and I saw the passion is that if a board is to come to Fort Worth that we make sure it's going to be one that works for Fort Worth. I do not mean that in like the, the tongue-in-cheek way. I mean in the legal way. I mean in there are only certain things that I can put out. There are only certain things that I can see. There are only staff members that can see certain things and I want to make sure whatever comes to Fort Worth is meant to work. And I say that because I'm watching police oversight being gutted left and right across this nation. For, not Fort Worth, excuse me, Florida is about to lose all police oversight. They are being stripped of their investigatory powers, they're being stripped of their boards, and I want to make sure whatever we bring here is going to stay and it is going to work. So my commitment is to do all that I can within the powers that I have to make sure that we have true oversight, and as the community makes clear its demands, that we support that as well. All right, thank you for that. We're going to take some questions. I, I do see that we have a representative from Commissioner Brooks' office, Roderick Miles, uh, here today. So we want to thank uh, Commissioner Brooks' office for being here, Roderick Miles. And so uh, we want to take an opportunity to take questions uh, from the community audience. If you have a question at this time. Yes, sir. And we'll repeat it for uh, the YouTube channel. Good evening. So what happens if there's a, there's a complaint, it's investigated, you review it, you schedule a community meeting to discuss you, the results and, and, and your feedback, and then the complainant files a lawsuit against the city. Can you still discuss the complaint results, or at that point, you have to wait until the legal proceedings conclude. 
for the most part. Summarize that for the YouTube channel. So if there has been a complaint or misconduct that's been filed, fully investigated, but at that point the community member has elected to file a civil suit, am I barred from discussion? My bar from discussion is limited to chapter 143 and that's pertaining to the internal affairs discussion. Um, and so no, I can still have a conversation about it because at that point, that investigation, are the, those are the facts at that point. So whatever comes from the civil suit investigation, that's a separate matter. And let me let me just ask a let me just ask a follow up question because I want to be I don't want to allude to something that may not happen. Uh, every complaint that's filed, there's not going to be a community meeting. Correct. No. That's developed. It is kind of going to be more of a one on one. The person who filed the complaint, they will have they will get information on what their complaint is, and yes. then it will really be up to your office, I guess, and maybe any other council member to follow up with other community meetings with those issues right. that have happened. So we know the large ones that are a community concern um, and we're aware of that and I communicate with the council members and we'll work on like an orchestrated effort to make sure that everyone's informed on the release whether or not we agree disagree with the outcome but for individual complaints one the individual is notified through a resolution letter and we also try to communicate with the complainant but I'm not committed to saying that what we're going to do is have a discussion every time. One of the things that I did in put in place is um, a monthly report that provides um, data, which is very important to me, to give you the understanding of the outcomes of cases and things of that nature. So while it might not say, and it will never say, Officer Jones was sustained on allegations of X, Y, and Z, it does provide the data of how many allegations have been sustained against um, Fort Worth Police Department officers, things of that nature, because we are prevented by state statute for providing certain levels of detail. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. yes. Uh, Here you go. <laughs> well, my name is Ronald. I have a question regarding you said about 180 days of it. Uh, that's the time frame that the uh, DA and them got into investigating uh, a case. That's the time frame that Fort Worth Police Department has to investigate if they don't get an extension. And that comes from the Attorney General that extension does. Okay. Because I was, uh, I had just been, I had uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had just. Uh, uh, went to court and they had told me that uh, it went from 90 days to 180 days because I bailed it out on a criminal case that I am that's pending right now and I go to Thursday to court again and uh, uh, and I try to ask why it was that they got an extension regarding this criminal case that's been unindicted yet you know and they just told me that it just it just um, which is how uh, they work, well, I'm not sure, I couldn't even remember so, exactly what it was that they had said, why they had gotten from 90 days to 180 days. Okay, so that's separate, but I'll give a general answer because um, I also want to keep my law license. So what you're talking about is if you've been arrested on a criminal matter and while you're in, in jail, if we think about just from a social reason, then they have to screen those cases and indict them faster than if someone's free. So once you're free and you're no longer within the confines, then they have an they have an automatic extension generally, let, let me speak in general terms, to then actually file those charges. And so that's unrelated to a misconduct investigation. That's a different time frame. So that's just, and that's pretty much standard across the nation, but that's standard for if you're in jail, there's a time frame, and you're out of jail, there's a longer time frame. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. I got one more question here. You mentioned that has uh, taken steps to help make changes uh, or ask changes uh, of the forward PD and how us community, I mean, view their identity, how they are to us, you know, because it, there's, 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 there is a very, you know, a strong line when it comes to, you know, when the community ask for some assistance help from the public PD and you know and when that takes place you know you know a lot of times us you know trying to get through our story or whatever it is that may be going on or in our situation and everything that they tend to be a little you know like they need some more people skills how to, keep, how to better you know uh, you know understand the situation instead of just coming in thinking they know the situation you know what I mean and you know, because uh, I would like to change, 
how I identify, how I see the forward PD in our community. You know what I mean? No, absolutely. And I don't want to look down upon them. You know what I mean? I'd rather look up from them. They are public. You know what I mean? You know? And, uh, uh, yeah, but that would be, you know, ho hopefully these steps that y'all have taken to help, you know, uh, kind of like improve their identity and how we view them. And so I, I just want to summarize, it. the yeah. statement in general was that when community members have interactions with the police department, for the police to actually listen and to see them and versus coming in with your or an already preconceived notion and improving communication skills. One of the other things we have the opportunity to do is provide training recommendations and review the training academy, which has done like leaps and bounds in comparison to what it's been. But a recommendation I've made in New Orleans before, and this was at the use of our mediators, is for an active listening class because officers are taught how to investigate and this is what you do time and time again and I know this as being a lawyer sometimes we stop listening completely to what people are saying like we're not hearing the feelings we're looking for the facts and teaching officers how to reflect those feelings while still gaining the investigatory knowledge that they need is something that I plan on making a recommendation for in the future as an in-service class so it would have to be optional just because there's so many t -call requirements but those are things that we are definitely concerned of how can we fix it without it just being complaint are there other improvements that can be made to restore trust thank you any other questions uh, Pamela Mm -hmm. What is the status of the MOU, the Memorandum of uh, Understanding, between your office and Fort Worth PD um, as far as requiring them to respond to uh, the recommendations that you give? I understand you said that you, you give them, it's noted that they've been given and received, um, but there was an MOU that Kim Neal was working on before she left that would require them to not just note that they received it, but to give a yes or no. Yes, we're going to implement this, or no, we're not going to implement this in either way. Yes or no, give a reason. What's the status on that? So that MOU was signed very quickly um, before Kim left. That is still in place. And I believe in the fall, um, since I've been here, I did get an update. They are providing feedback on whether or not it's been implemented and things of that nature. So it's not just simply received. They do recognize when they receive it, but they do provide feedback if it's like duplicative of something that they're already doing or if it's going to be implemented in some way. And so we have an entire spreadsheet with over 100 and I'm looking at Aaron, like over 140 recommendations, I would say. 202 recommendations and they have the outcome of those recommendations on them. That's what I was going to ask. Can that be published? So that is something we are working on our biennial annual report. Um, it's just been a change in leadership. So we're going to combine those two years. And then the previous annual report gave that general information. My goal is to be able to provide that in a more detailed way um, in our annual report. And I think we can bar you from making all of that public. No, so there's nothing barring from providing the recommendations and the outcome, but oftentimes, and I'll have to navigate that with legal on if I can say what it's connected to. So I can say like there's been a recommendation for X, Y, and Z, but I can't necessarily say because it was with officer so-and-so. So it's just towing that line and providing useful information to the community, um, but making sure that you're informed to use it um, in the future. And I just want to highlight that question just for the YouTube channel. This will be you can review it again so other people can see it. The question was, has there been an MOU established between OPUM office and the police chief's office to make sure that once a recommendation is sent to them, they are to say they're going to... Uh, Whether or not they're going to actually follow the recommendation. And that is established. That is happening. And that's happening. And I do just want to, I'm, I'm, do want to say that we do have a positive working relationship with the department. I meet with the chief every two weeks. I meet with internal affairs multiple times a month. And since being on board, they've been very responsive and respectful to the office and understanding of where we're coming from. And so I don't think there's been one issue that I've brought to them where I've been met with great resistance. And I'm hoping that that continues to uh, bear fruit of positive police relationships between the community and the police department and I can second that because during this whole process they were really completely against a lot of things the OPUM office and funding it and uh, and not so much the, I'm not talking about the police department but outsiders as in you know the POA or other folks that supports the police department but as time has taken place 
more things are coming in and we'll be able to do more things. So I appreciate your leadership in making sure that happens and your office as well is kind of working with our police department. We have time for maybe about a couple of more questions. Again, we want to get stop at seven and then you got a question? Okay, we'll come to you next. You may have briefly touched on it, but can you give us an example of a city that has a civilian oversight board and an office like OPOM? So an example of a city that has a civilian oversight board and our office, um, I'm trying to think of the exact name of it, but let's just, Dallas has it, quite frankly. Dallas has, I don't remember the official name of the person that has my position, but it's ran out of the city. And then they have a civilian oversight board, but their board was supposed to have investigatory powers. But if you've seen the media recently, that's been contested of whether or not they'll be able to do investigations that have not been approved by the department to be investigated. But that also has its problems because whether or not they could actually compel officers to provide testimony was an issue, whether or not they could subpoena, things of those nature. Atlanta has one, um, Miami has it. There are several cities that do have them, that have both, yes. What, let's on. go to her real quick, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Switch walk. <laughs> I'd say thank you. Thank you so much, and welcome to Fort Worth. Thank you. Um, this this um, police oversight monitor program is great, much needed um, for the mediation. If there was a complaint, if I had a complaint uh, prior to the oversight. Can I, is it too late for mediation? Because the situation that happened, it left me emotional, uh, just really hurt by the situation that happened. It was uncalled for, unjust, and I thought to myself, if I could just have a moment with this officer to get an understanding as to why you did what you did. It was unjust and immoral in my eyes. Um, that never happened. So, because this wasn't here. Is there a way that I, I still would like to speak to this officer? See what's going on with him, see if anything has happened since then um, in his record. But is there a way that I can have a mediation, although it was, this happened in 2021? So unfortunately the, unfortunately, the way that the program is structured, it will start with complaints that come in April 1st. But what I will say is I'm never going to just say no. And so I'm happy to have the conversation. I'm happy for us to sit down and try to talk to the officer. They're never obligated to participate in the mediation program. And we don't have the um, draw of that you're not going to be investigated. But I'm happy to have the conversation to see if it's something we can facilitate. But the focus is on present um, complaints and investigations. And if you reach out to my office, I will see what I can do. Because with this mediation happening, the sentiment of we're trying to make a, a amend to the community. And so, although it might not fall under the mediation, but we may can have a conversation that can change the narrative. Okay? Yes, Pamela. All right, we're getting ready to wrap it up. Uh, do anybody else have a question? No? Okay. Um. You said that the goal is to monitor complaints in real time, but you're not there yet. When is that going to happen and what's the holdup? So I, I honestly think that we're pretty close to being there if we're not there now. Um, in 2020, what started was essentially the backlog of cases and establishing the numbers. Um, and so we have been to this point reviewing all of the old cases that came through internal affairs and making sure they're up to par. And so now I think with reducing the time frame, we're able to get closer to real time. Also internal affairs has improved their investigations and their investigation time. So before we, they were getting cases and we're still getting some at like day 179. So I can't monitor that in real time, but I also don't have the time within the team to monitor a case in real time because they were so backlogged. But I believe that we're very close to being out of the backlog. And I have the staff in order to be able to monitor them in real time. We got a complaint in today at probably 12 and we've already reviewed the BWC and there's actually the complaint hasn't even been filed yet but we're monitoring real time. We've notified the department that we're going to be following that investigation and so that's what we're attempting to do now. I love this question. I ask this question to every department. Do we need more staff in this department to make sure that we can get that backlog down, uh, down pat? 
we we need more staff to ensure that we're providing realistic oversight and to continue continue to do meaningful work. I have visions for the office on what we continue to do, and that requires growing the team. I don't want to just be an office that reviews misconduct complaints, um, and so I want to grow from there, and that will require most, more staffing in the future. So community, when they have the budget meetings around the city, and David Cook comes out with your council member, you want to highlight that there's more staff that's needed in the old pump office so that they not only hear from Jeanette and myself arguing these points, but they actually hear from the community. And I'm being totally serious. We have two or three people that come out to these budget meetings, but we're here now understanding if we want to see this be successful and to get into real time, as you say, let's ask those hard questions. The city of Fort Worth is the 13th largest city in the United States of uh, America. We can make this happen. Last and final question, Ms. Tina James. Um, my question was, as we are investigating the officers and the situations at hand, let's just say, for instance, uh, hypothetically, this officer has had several complaints, mm -hmm. but he shows up on time, he puts in extra work, comes in early, leaves late, but he has a, um, <coughs> a repetitious problem with doing the same thing and just getting a slap on the wrist. What will be the following actions if it keeps happening and or in his file that it has shown that he has done this several times? Is there so but not to go into too much detail and to do it quickly. One, that's something that PD should be following, but that's also why we're here. So if you have an officer that's doing the same behavior, let's just say it's rudeness, because that's, that's technically small on the disciplinary scale. But we see this time and time again, then that's also going to be reflected in the discipline. But also what I'm going to flag is, hey, chain of command, we need to look at this, because we actually need to see if this officer is fit for duty. It, it, do they need, and maybe it's that they don't need to be on the street, they need to be somewhere else doing something else. It could be that they're burnout. Like I, I will give some grace for whatever the thing is, but that is absolute, one of the things I didn't include on there is when we look at the complaint, we also look at personnel history and not just for sustained allegations. Is this officer getting a pattern of rudeness complaints that ha have been exonerated or unfounded, but do we need to stop and pause and look at something else? Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you so much. Uh, for coming into the community and having this conversation. Yep, that's that's good. I'll be here. We can talk. Yeah. Well, I mean, for everyone to be involved in the conversation. Well, we ha only have room for an hour. We was gonna do offline conversation. We, do we have enough? I, I feel you. I feel you. I understand. Jeanette, I think Jeanette has something. I just had a comment. If, if really do want to give your input on the budget, do it now before it gets built out. Mm -hmm. Because then at these presentations, you know, it gets presented what's going into the budget, but nothing really changes. So I would do it now if you're going to push to uh, recommend more positions for that department. Und understood. Uh, did you have an additional question? I didn't. Okay. We'll take your last question, then we'll close out. I have several, so let me pick. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right. Question about the complaint process. I notice in Austin, um, if you go to the PD website there for internal affairs, so it's two ways, right, that y'all do it here. Mm -hmm. You can go through IA or you can go directly to OCOM. In Austin, um, when you go to IA or to the police website, it redirects you to the OPOM website. Um, and I noticed that you said only 40 of those complaints came to your office and several hundred went to IA because that's all we have had here mm -hmm. up until you know recently and a lot of people still don't know that you exist, this office exists. My question is, what are your thoughts on moving in that direction so that everything is funneled through you, not going to IA first, but coming to OPOM first because that is your action. So the, I wanna make sure the complaint, complaint is received. And so I don't necessarily have a preference of where it originates from as long as it's received and I can monitor it. Um, but I did just have a conversation with Internal Affairs on Friday about being able to provide inf additional information like status of complaints, being able to file and whatever is linked on their website actually shoots straight back to my website. And so that there's more, um, it's more community facing and people know. 
I'm working really, really hard to make sure people know that this office exists. And, and I think it's proven in the numbers. I don't want to say that I only want it to come through OPOM because I want it however I'm going to get the complaint. One of the additional things that I've committed to doing is also trying to train other community organizations um, to be able to help us with the referral process. So for example, I gave a, uh, a speech last week at the LGBTQ police and fire chief uh, luncheon and my call for action for them was, if you hear something when you're interacting with someone there, I wanna make sure that you're equipped to be able to refer that complaint to me because I don't want someone that's been harmed to have to go through, you're gonna go meet with LGBTQ LGBTQ saves because that's where you're comfortable and then want to tell you to come meet with us that I don't want to create those additional steps so wherever anyone's comfortable going that's where I want them to go I'm going to give this real quick plug new city hall is happening and it is beautiful and it is spacious and it has a gym and a cafeteria and I would love to be there but we are committed to the community and so OPOM will be leaving old city hall we will not be going to New City Hall, but we are going to go to the Old Gwen School on Rosedale. We're going there to be more community facing and more accessible and to really limit those barriers. So we do want to be the first place that people go, but I don't want to ever restrict their ability to come to uh, uh, go to the police department as well. Thank you. I think that's a good place to stop. Um, again, I want to thank Angela also for helping us secure this room. Uh, so we appreciate you with Texas Westland and Alan and all of you. Thank you uh, officers for being here as well. We are committed to working with our police officers because they do make sure our city is safe. And so uh, thank you again for being here. And so this information will be uploaded on our city YouTube channel. The OPOM office was live on Instagram. We were live on our council page, Councilman Nettles page of Facebook. So thank you again. We'll do this again, another opportunity. Uh, we want to just come out to the community. So with that, uh, we're going to end our conversation. Thank you. So thank you guys for coming and have a good evening. <laughs>